Before we dive into today's podcast, this episode is sponsored by Rebuy, an end-to-end personalization platform for Shopify and Shopify Plus stores. Now, personalizing your Shopify store isn't a nice to have, it's definitely a must. You know, did you know that over 75% of online shoppers are more inclined to buy from brands that offer a personalized shopping experience? You know, it's no surprise then that stores that embrace personalization, they see significant boosts in conversion rates and average order value and even customer lifetime value. So if you're looking for the simplest and most effective way to deliver smart, tailored experiences to your Shopify customers, look no further than Rebuy. This is a powerful platform and has a suite of game-changing features. A few that I love, AI-powered smart search is really there to help shoppers find exactly what they need. They also have precise and well-timed product recommendations. Really, that's there to increase your cart size. And the best part, I love their smart cart. It's stunning and intelligent shopping cart experience. I would say it's market leading, it's the best. You know, and with results like this, it's clear why more than 10,000 of the fastest Shopify stores have already turned to rebuy to wow their customers and skyrocket their sales. So don't miss out on the personalization revolution because it's happening right now. And as a special guest to e-commerce Fastlane listeners, rebuy is offering the first 45 days absolutely free. And all you have to do is go to rebuyengine.com forward slash fast lane. And there you can sign up and get going on this platform absolutely free. You're listening to e-commerce fast lane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Hey there, well, welcome back to e-commerce Fastlane. I'm your host, Steve Hutt. You know, thanks so much for tuning in today. You know, there are, as I always say, there's so many podcasts in the kind of direct to consumer and the marketing space and Shopify powered brands. I just want to just sincerely thank you so much for uh, listening to today's episode. It's going to be an exciting episode today. And I know it may not sound like fulfillment and the kind of the post purchase experience, but honestly, it's a very important criteria that as a brand founder or as a marketer, you have to be very, very conscious and aware about what is the experience that my customers are feeling when an order is placed. Trust me, the order and the the process is not done. I'd argue that it's probably just started because they they're now in anticipation of their product and then how it's packaged and bundled and and the unboxing experience and the speed and and there's so many things to talk about um, and the multi-channel experience that's happening right now that brands have to be involved in when it comes to logistics and how they can get the most reach possible about building their brand so today i'd like to welcome paul jarrett he's the co-founder and ceo of a company called bulu and they're at bulu group so b-u-l-u group.com i think he also has a personal brand pauljarrett.com but paul welcome to the show Steve, thank you so much for having me. Um, logistics does sound kind of boring, it and does. Uh, but let's make it fun today. <laughs> let's let's. I always say, man, if folks would just speak truthfully and and be open and honest, like I think logistics is like the most fun board game puzzle available. So <laughs> we'll we'll see though, right? We'll let the audience decide. Absolutely, and I, you know, being in Shopify, it was one of the things that I had to speak about you know, every quarter to talk about, you know, hey, where are you at from either your self-fulfilled warehouse opportunity and the software you're using and and kind of the stresses and the strengths and weaknesses of of that. And then on the flip side, it's just like, you know, have you thought about migrating to a 3PL and having, you know, stop trying to be the expert of fulfilling an order instead of like, how about being an expert on marketing your business and creating a brand experience? And so I think these kind of Tug of wars happen, which I'll, we'll definitely get into that conversation today. I want to talk about your origin story first. I, I think it's always interesting to me why people build what they build. So let's talk about like you, the founder, and kind of what got you to to Bulu today. And let's talk about some of your service offerings. Yeah, well, thank you for that. You know, it's interesting because it's so easy to like fall into that like classic founder story, right? And I think some founders like kind of believe it, but. You know, I always feel like there's just nothing more interesting than the truth, right? And what I would say is my parents were entrepreneurs, but 
entrepreneurs was like always a dirty word. It's like what you'd call yourself <laughs> if you couldn't find a job, right? And and same like hustler means a very different meaning where uh -huh. I'm from. But yep. you know, I think that in ways it's kind of classic of I grew up, we didn't have a lot of money. We grew up in a, uh, you know, we're supposed to say bubble home park, but trailer park in Nebraska, right, right. next to the city sewer. Right? Oh, nice. um, and it was just from a young age, if we wanted something, the expectation was we had to figure out how to buy it ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. so shoes, you know, it was like, well, do I want my dad to saw off the tip of my shoe and put duct tape on it? Or do I want to go mow yards and figure it out, you know? Probably the only argument I ever really witnessed my parents getting into was if I was old enough to mow or not. And all I know is <laughs> my arms were fully extended above my head, pushing the mower. And mom and dad were yelling at each other about he needs to learn how to work. So I would say like, you know, having parents that are entrepreneurs and just always having that attitude, like if, if you want something, you got to go get it. Nobody's going to hand it to you in life. And so I would say as I grew up, if anything... I always figured out ways, you know, mowed the yards. I was like, wow, that's crazy. I did all that work, 30 bucks. I remember going to a flea market in a trailer park. Yep, that sounds really, you know, <laughs> that's white. That's about as white trash as it gets, right? <laughs> and so I went to this flea market and of course I'm a little kid. They have ninja stars and switchblades and I'm like, blew all my money there, right? Yeah. And I went back to school and these kids were like, whoa, how'd you get a ninja star? How'd you get whatever? And I just started selling everything for an absurd amount of money back, right? Right. And um, then, you know, whether it was burning CDs. So there's just always my entire life been something where I thought, man, I can make a little money and get those shoes that I want, or I can make a little money and get that jacket, even all the way up through college, selling thousands of items on eBay. And so I think that I always knew, even though I had a professional career of advertising and worked in New York City and San Francisco, I always knew that it was wise to kind of like have a side hustle just in case or so I could get that little bit of edge. And then I would say the turning point was working in New York City, working in advertising and witnessing half the agency getting laid off. Right. And it was just common there. And it and I just had this thing click in my mind of like, well, at least if I ran my own business, I would know when I would have to let myself go <laughs> or I would know versus yeah. like, I really don't believe or trust anything in a corporate company because there's external forces, you know, pandemic right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so as much as it felt safe in the corporate world, it actually was ominous and scary after going through those experiences. And so it really took a friend of mine who pushed me over the edge and he was my first investor and all of that stuff. And mm. it was, you know, I think a lot of, I think the thing that holds people back from starting is the fear of embarrassment. And I think if you can get over that and just know that it is not going to go how you expect, and that's not the point. The point is that you figure it out along the way, <laughs> figure out what problem you're solving. Mm -hmm. um, then things tend to work themselves out. But I would say that once we did understand kind of the venture capital game and all of that stuff, we came up with this idea and it's pretty simple. It's called Bulu Box. And we saw what Birchbox was doing. They were doing a sample box for makeup. And based on my experience and working around the country, I knew that vitamins and supplements are typically a fast follower to makeup. So if vitamin E is popular in the makeup industry, then typically vitamin E as a supplement is fast to follow. So I actually searched for the idea and it didn't exist. And I looked at my wife and I said, hey, that sample box thing for makeup that those couple of companies are doing, yeah. like there's nothing for vitamins and supplements. And I remember yeah. I thought I misspelled supplements or something, right? <laughs> because when do you ever Google something and there's just, you know, yeah. tumbleweed, nothing there. It never happens. Right. And so then kind of it set in of like, we better move fast. I'm sure somebody's going to do this. Yeah. And um, I used to be embarrassed to say this, but 12 years now, I'm, I'm okay with it. I think we're over it. But from concept to getting 1.5 million in capital, it was like, it was somewhere between 48 to 65 days. We're still kind of in an argument of when it was, but it was very, very, very fast that my co-founder slash wife, Stephanie, and I raised capital. We launched Bulu Box, four to five premium vitamin supplement samples for 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. Try it out, see what you like. Come back, buy full size. And then we started manufacturing and selling our own products based on the data. That grew to 60,000 subscribers, 
customer acquisition costs became an issue. So we started doing it for big brands like Disney, GNC, Crayola. That was pretty much the model of the company. And we had some really, really big growth years. And then um, the pandemic came. Right. And a lot of the things that we were doing were innovation, were you know, $10 million annually on a project or a program for Disney is nothing, right? And so a lot of those brands just hit pause or, you know, frankly, like in logistics, it was like everybody kind of stopped paying everybody in a lot of categories. And I tell people, you know, had we been shipping one bread maker or one basic need, our company would have been much different. But Mm -hmm. considering we went through that, and I love big brands, but in a time of chaos, like your contract really doesn't matter. The lawyers matter. You know what I mean? And we avoided all of that, but it was a real good eye opener. And so I kind of looked at our co-founder and and we decided like, hey, we're not quite sure what we're going to do, but let's buy this company because there's so many assets, there's so much opportunity. And somehow maybe, how do we take what we've learned from these big brands, you know, over the past 12 years? And how do we create something that solves a problem for everybody else? We're entrepreneurs, we love, like, how do we find people in logistics that truly understand that you can grow your company through correct distribution, et cetera, Um, not just people that are like, how do I get lower shipping rates? Right. And so we started doing that and we found a couple novel, you know, ways of doing things. And really it was probably the end of last year where we really figured out what we're doing. Um, and things have really started to take off. And, and I also left out a little part where we built and sold the software. It's now called (laughs) rangeme.com. I don't know if people know how popular that is or whatever, but it's like linkedin.com for consumer packaged goods. But. Oh, okay. That's kind of a, you know, a side hustle on top of the side hustle, right? But um, that went well. That was clearly a home run billion dollar idea. But unfortunately, because of the place we were as a company, we had to sell it off. So yeah, a lot of experience in this area, manufacturing, whatever. But we love what we're doing now. And we're just helping brands ship like a major brand and tackle direct to consumer, tackle B2B tackles social media tiktok i'm sure is you know everybody's talking about that now right but how do you actually pull that off and get the package into customers hands Mm -hmm. the way that you intended and it sounds like such a simple thing but that's a really long answer but that's what we're up to now no i love it and thank you for sharing all that i think it's nice to have some good context about like people's i mean it's like you know it's it's the whole uh 10 year overnight success kind of thing (laughs) you've clearly put in the work and you know, a lot of failures, a lot of wins along the way. And I just love the idea of taking some ideas um, and learnings, you know, from some big brands and kind of what they're doing with large budgets and then right. applying it right. towards your own business. And now paying it forward now with uh, Bulu and saying, hey, you know, if you are a health and nutrition kind of product, healthy snack kind of company, you have a lot of experience in that in that field and you understand. And so I want to talk a bit about, just before we get into like the specifics about kind of the, your service offering, it's just like, this comes up a lot in conversation with the book of merchants that I used to have in Shopify was like some brands do the self-fulfillment thing and they, and they get some kind of you right. know, inventory or warehouse management software and some forecasting software right. um, connected to their Shopify store. And they kind of go down that journey and they start in their garage first and then they, you know, get a five and 10,000 square foot warehouse. They kind of continue right. down that journey. And so what do you see of like, when is it the right time to say, stop self-fulfilling right. and move to a 3PL slash a company very I mean, to what Bulu is doing today for brands. I just like want to hear your, your lay of the land on that. Yeah, I think so much of it has to do with what are you trying to build? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your goals, right? If it's a situation where you're just like, hey, you know, I, I want this, you know, I think the phrase is lifestyle business, right? I mean, I want to kind of build this thing and be profitable and, and I'm not looking to take over the world. I highly encourage people to handle it themselves and learn the ins and outs. And, um, you know, we did that pretty early on, but we, we, we've tried to avoid that because we had venture capital funding, right? Right. Now, if you're looking to kind of, you know, quote unquote, take over the world or be on every shelf or whatever, I have a pretty firm stance and you should probably start from day one working with a fulfillment company. And I feel the same way about like, you know, legal, right? Like if you're going to do it yourself, your business or whatever, like maybe you could use a rocket lawyer, some tools out there or whatever, (laughs) and and, and you feel safe enough, right? But if you're going to be aggressive and there's venture capital and investors and 
partnerships involved, like you better find a good firm and probably a few different ones to make sure that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish without looking over your shoulder. Right. Right. So I think that, you know, if you are looking to make money, be profitable, also experience a whole lot of headaches, like that's awesome. Do it yourself, learn it inside and out, (laughs) work locally, know that there will probably be a point where we see a lot of times around that 10,000 a month mark and like five thousand two two to 5,000, we see people start getting stressed if they're doing, doing it themselves. 10,000, it's really, they're pulling their hair out, you know, and then there's something about this 14,000 a month number where like just things start to break. And, and even a couple months ago, we had a brand come to us and I was kind of like, let me guess where you ship about 15,000 doing it yourself. And like, <laughs> you know, and I'm like 12 years, you hear it a lot. So But I think that if you're looking to scale, you're looking to grow, you have to look at your product in, you know, a really vague, broad, you know, depends on product category. But, you know, when it comes to storing, packing, shipping, you're probably looking at 10% to 20% of the retail going to that. Now, Mm -hmm. again, there's a lot of catches to that. But the point is like understanding your margins and what you need to scale. And when those price breaks come with volume and having the right partner, that's building a model to scale very large, very quickly, you know, potentially globally. Mm. And then there's kind of the other version of, hey, I just want to sell this, yeah, you know, this barbecue sauce that I made or whatever. And then there's everything in between. You know, you got your ship bobs, your shipmates, and there's pros and cons to a lot of those. Mm-hmm. But I think ultimately it boils down to like, what are your goals? Like, what do you want this to look like in the end? And if it's set up to be acquired, like yeah, I'd probably like use a third party, right? Yeah, if it's sure. set up to pass it to your kid or mm-hmm. pass it on to somebody, like, right. yeah, maybe like build those facilities yourself. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. And I I, I didn't know the numbers about, you know, pulling your hair out at 14,000 plus, but it, it actually mm-hmm. starts to make a lot of sense because then all of a sudden you start have to needing like a warehouse manager, um, an HR yep. person. It starts adding that, a lot of headcount and a lot of yeah. extra cost to have to run and manage all that. Yep. I really pressed our, you know, we have some brands that we worked with for probably 10 years and, you know, you get them on site and you build a relationship with these big brands and finally have a couple beers and you go, like, yeah, hey, hey, Sally, I just got to ask you, like, what, what, what is it that keeps you coming back or whatever? And I've asked this question. And finally, you know, you start to get the truth out of people after a lot of, you know, trust, respect and all that stuff. And uh, hands down, I've, these big brands turn to me and they go, HR. And I'm like, what? It's like HR, the amount of people that you have to hire to like, you know, do the 150,000 kits, literally it doesn't work within the business model. And, and so what we see is with scale, there is a lot of HR preparation challenges. You know, I was inundated with, even though we have a team for everything right around tax season, I just get lit up with text messages of how do I get my W2? <laughs> and I have no idea who the person is. And then the other thing I think that people underestimate is you could be the best brand in the world and the best customer experience, but there will always be a percentage of customers that email you with, where is my box at? I want to change size. So with that volume growth physically, there's also a real customer service and HR scale. And you you can kind of learn the percentages and expect it, but those are a lot of sit down, work it out, headache problems. So mm-hmm. I always think man, if something is a headache and it's preventing you from doing what you're best at, offload it. Like, would you be a lawyer? Would you be an accountant? You know, like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Treat it the same way. Yeah, 100%. I want to talk a bit about the, I guess, the the thought of why you have chosen. It's just uh, just the fact, because you really are doubling down both in the health and nutrition and kind of the healthy snack kind of market and supplements. Is there a particular reason, like what, what's unique about fulfillment of CPG products? Because the reason I'm asking is because some brands, they have some requirements of maybe temperature control or lot numbers right. and things like that. And certain lots sometimes have to be pulled for whatever reason, you know, some quality control issues and things like that. So like, what's your take on CPGs in general, just consumable products? And why are you finding it successful to, as, as being like your core business? There was a, a very much sit down think through it, like really look at the industry, look at the market. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we did the consumer package gets thing. We did the software thing, right? We raised capital on both of those things. And when I personally 
kind of look ahead to the future and, you know, where is the opportunity? Where are the most problems? I'm sitting right now in a 120,000 square foot warehouse um, with a whole bunch of people and things behind me, right? Mm -hmm. And what I see is a gold mine of problems to solve everything from time clock issues to, you know, how do you get a barcode off the top of the rack without spending five minutes doing it? Right. And I think that as much as we all want to believe like robots, AI or whatever, I think we got a good five to seven years. Right. And with AI and with code and software, it almost I saw that as like, oh, that's Adobe graphic designers part two in the, in the right. software industry. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so like it was a very much like we get the question all the time, like, why is a team like ours in logistics? Because, you know, that I think the thought is you should raise capital and build software and whatever. And and I kind of look at them and, and I chuckle to myself because. I see nothing but opportunity. And I think that's starting to happen in the pandemic kind of fast forwarded that. And so I think that right now in the industry and what we see with CPG brands is that, you know, let's just say supply chain is uh, eight steps, right? And I know a lot of people could argue, you know, five or 12 or whatever, but, and let's say 3PL is store pack ship. It's like three out of those eight steps for supply chain logistics, et cetera. It's always interesting to kind of like have a conversation about logistics and make it so everybody can participate right <laughs> so so for the hardcore operations people i know i'm bastardizing it a little bit and for the newbies um to it you know it might sound more complicated than it is but it's all about getting something from point a to point b and what we see is those steps in the supply chain where a lot of people would classify us as a 3pl well we've dipped into manufacturing and sales distribution and technology is allowing that nowadays right. and i've even heard on some of your podcasts some amazing software and technologies, right? Uh -huh. And that is one thing, but to have that and to also follow through like we do on the physical part where we see brands doing well and we see the opportunity is how do you find partners that aren't a 3PL, but they're a 5PL, right? How are you shortening mm -hmm. those, those steps? We're in Nebraska. There's actually a co-packer for coffee and a co-packer for all sorts of food around us. And so I feel like that has a lot to do with like why we're doing what we're doing, why we're temperature, humidity controlled, all that stuff. But anytime you can shorten those, you know, I feel like if I was to build a software, I'm really spending a ton of time talking to people, trying to figure out a very specific problem that I can solve with software mm -hmm. and probably know that Google or Apple isn't too far behind me with some sort of AI that'll do it, you know, two years <laughs> after me, right? Yeah. Whereas in supply chain, it's pretty simple where I'm looking at those steps and I'm learning how all these brands that we fulfill for do it. And then we're cutting out those steps. And now all of a sudden you're saving people one to four dollars per shipment. Mm. It wasn't that hard. You're a hero. How do you copy paste that, that um, same process and provide it to a lot of people? And I think that's the thing where. I view our role as Bulu as how can we break down the intimidation and the barriers to logistics because I remember what it's like to talk to a fulfillment company and not know right. anything, right? 12 yeah. years ago, right? Yeah. And our attitude is this is actually not that hard. It isn't complex. It's very complicated. And how do we talk, walk, act in a manner that removes that intimidation and allows people to kind of work together with us to figure out how to shorten those steps in supply chain. And, and so far that's, um, it's attracted some really cool brands lately. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, so I can't confirm nor deny like a Gary Vaynerchuk, but there's some pretty <laughs> cool, cool shoes and stuff over here. So Love you, right. baby. we'll, <laughs> we'll keep that on the DL for now, but but yeah, okay. like anybody's uh, listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see about that. Yeah. So I want to talk about like uh, what I find also unique. When I did a little research uh, about Bulu is the fact that you do some like you're really all in on subscription box companies. Like, there's that recurring kind of revenue that comes in of you right. know, always being there, the monthly and the and, yep. and the and the quarterly kind of boxes that are available in your space. But I also find it interesting about the kitting. It's so interesting yeah. where it sounds like you're almost like a, a business partner with a lot of these brands saying, hey. What do you want to have specifically in this box? Is there a certain kind of POP it needs to go in? Right. Do you want certain tissue paper? Oh, you want to have a branded box that's kind of environmentally conscious and kind of friendly yep. And, yep. and all that. And it sounds like you have a lot of relationships of saying, hey, let's sit down and talk about the A to Z of kind of where we're at. And, and for this quarter, like I always think of like, for example, like uh, Jillian Harris 
Uh, she has a, a, a former uh, bachelorette or bachelor, you know, in, the, in, the, in this bachelor world. And she lives here in Vancouver, British Columbia. She's in the, in the, in the Okanagan. And she has a thing called a jelly box. And she comes out yeah. every quarter. It's very popular. I can't even guess how many thousands of subscribers she has, but it's, right. you know, she's quite popular doing her thing. And it's so interesting because my wife subscribes to it. And, and uh, you know, it's so well packaged and put together. And there's a lot of care and thought in her quarterly box. And so I'll throw that back to you. It's like, like, why do you see value in that? And then is there service from your organization to say, yeah, we're going to help you get all the right pieces together to create the best kind of unboxing experience that you want for your business, right? Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And I appreciate it. I'm like, whoa, you, you did your homework. I did indeed. <laughs> so it's interesting because with Bulu Box, where we are a subscription box and, you know, kind of one thing that we planned on that we didn't realize was going to be that difficult. And this goes back to we were one of the first users of Shopify. I was, I was such a pain to <laughs> Shopify that uh, Toby, their CEO, would handle me in customer service. Oh, wow. That's like, the early days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which I, I should have listened to him when he said build a subscription payment app. But I was like, who, who is this guy? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, now I know how to listen. But we unknowingly kind of selected with kidding and bundling something that was very difficult. Also, our plan was to integrate and to sell the sample box, subscription box of vitamins and supplements in different locations. And we very quickly learned about EDI compliance and all of that stuff. And after, you know, we just kind of launched, we went to 1.3PL and, you know, they said they could do everything. And we literally kind of crushed them with the volume that we were doing. So we scrambled and got another one. Same exact story. Kind of begrudgingly took it over, like literally bought the place for a dollar physically move some of our people in and our plan was to actually find what we're doing now and we just that day never came so what's interesting is really within the last year we're solving the problem that we saw 12 years ago and it's just mind-blowing to me that nothing has kind of came along and when you start out doing the most complicated kits and you grow to 60,000 in a very quick time. That's why a lot of those big brands would start to call us and go like, how are you pulling this off? And, you know, if it was manual, we would just tell them like, we're just manually doing this thing. And they're like, that's crazy. And we're like, well, we're in Nebraska. We don't know any better. We know how to work. Right. <laughs> but everything that we did, there was always that goal of like put automation behind it. So at one point in time, we actually had built our own WMS, mm. um, warehouse management yeah. system. Mm. We could very quickly see that there was a big opportunity, but as for a small market of large brands and, you know, they could kind of do what we we're doing with their own software. But that experience with big brands and, you know, if you're doing a couple million boxes for a GNC, and they're like, oh, hey, by the way, we have this corporate gift golfing thing. Can you guys help out with that? The, the answer is yes, I can. <laughs> right? <laughs> you just say yes, because they're going to pay the bill and it's going to be fine. And just over the years of launching over, we lost track after 52, 52 different subscription type programs. Mm. And maybe that's gifting or auto renew. I just, we call it the tricky ship, right? And then we'd have excess inventory for Crayola. We'd say like, hey, like this is silly. Let's put this on eBay. And they're like, that's a great idea, right? Yeah. And so we were doing all of these things for the big brands. And then you just look over and, you know, there's poor people, you know, just getting beat up with a retail buyer meeting about EDI compliance. And you're kind of going, man, I would love to knowledge drop and help those folks out. And so yeah. The pandemic allowed us to make that shift. And now it's really cool because what I would say is nothing we are doing is impossible for anybody else to do. But is it something that you really want to deal with and go through the pain? And I would say all of the million, geez, tens of millions <laughs> of boxes and items that we've shipped. I wish I had a better answer when people go, wait, how do you do direct and B2B and how do you do all these things? Yeah. And the, the real answer, like we didn't know any better and we made every mistake in the book. And a lot of those mistakes were because nobody else was attempting it, you know, mm -hmm. and you get that call from GameStop and, and they were doing a big thing with their founder, made all these books and you know, they were calling everybody and, and I'm going, what's the problem? What's the problem? And, you know, one three PL calls another one, everybody's. And when you settle everybody down and you get them on the phone and you go, okay, so like, 
the inventory could be here, here, or here, and we need it here in 48 hours. Am I hearing that correct? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And I look at my team and I'm like, who wants to drive a U-Haul? Yeah. And, uh, uh -huh. My hand goes up. I'm like, and they're like, what? You're just going to like drive a U-Haul to the, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. And they're like, everybody laughs in the room. So you're going to get in the U-Haul, drive to all of these other 3PLs, knock on the door, tell them what's going on. They're going to load it up. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what we're going to do. Mm. And just those things, you know, you just do them over experience, you know, and you learn. And then when you can take all of those and you can tell people like, hey, you know, the the lady that was doing the subscription box, the jelly box, yeah, right? Jelly box, yeah. Just little things like you go, hey, you know, why don't we pre-kit three of the items that we know are going to be there? Let's store them. Actually, we can put those pallets on top of each other if it's okay. That'll save you money. So it's all those like little like tricks that you learn over time working with these big brands. And you do a few of those and then all of a sudden, you know, your client, like I said, they love you because you're saving them one to four bucks. And it's just pure volume, pure time, tons of mistakes, working with the best people, taking the best parts of those and offering it to everybody else so they can quote unquote ship like a major brand. Mm -hmm. That's really the thing that I, I wish there was a better aha moment or, yeah. you know, we're so smart, but I'm like, nah, we've, we've literally blood, sweat and tears. We've, we've earned the knowledge that we have in the industry and the Rolodex goes a long way in our industry. Like, do you know, somebody is a big deal. At least that's what I see a big advantage that we have. Yeah, and I see the, you know, the fact uh, with your primary warehouse where you're at right now in Nebraska, I mean, being in Central America right. really gives you some opportunity. I mean, the, I think you you quote like 95% yeah. of the U.S. is reached in within three days via ground shipping. Yeah. So it's still, you know, they get a tracking number. Um, there's that anticipation of it and it's still, but it's, it's cheap, affordable with a tracking number. Everybody's happy, you know? Massive, massive advantage where you go, hey, look. Let everybody else, you know, the kind of the people that popped up in the pandemic and, mm -hmm. and let all these other fulfillment companies and softwares yeah. fight over the two day shipping. Nobody's right. going to be deliver probably at this point. Right. <laughs> no. What about we do three day and if an order comes in by 11 a.m. or by 2 p.m., we will get that out that same day. Mm -hmm. It's pretty competitive. And when people see the actual positives that come with ground shipping and, and uh, on top of the dollar amount, it's, it's really a no brainer. And, and people go, you know, oh, you guys are geniuses for that. And, and you go, yeah, just like we got tired of fighting for two day rates. And yeah. somebody went, well, what about three days? You know, and that, that's how those things happen. I want to pivot to Amazon. It's a great segue because it's like the multi-channel experience. I tell most brands, I listen, like you have your direct to consumer store certainly is step number one. But there's so much opportunity out there. Amazon is one of them. I think I want to get into TikTok stores in a minute or TikTok shops in a minute. I want to talk about that. Um, but just like from Amazon perspective. So talk about your service offering and uh, of like, going to FBA centers or uh, your direct fulfillment of Amazon uh, product. I, just want, I, I want to understand what service that you have available. Yeah. So I'm instructed by my team. We've, we've grown to a point where I'm like, I was like the person that set up all the Amazon stuff. And now I probably click around and go, huh, where's the password? <laughs> yeah. We do every aspect of Amazon shipping, you know, merchant, um, FBA, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We also, I can legally say we have a friendship with Amazon. <laughs> I push them for that. So we do get invited down there and that's, that's pretty cool when Amazon is picking your brain about shipping. Um, it's definitely a situation where like, you know, keep your enemies close, but also it's like Amazon. It's just a different beast. Right. And it's great to, you know, quote unquote, as friends, help them with their subscription stuff, their podcast stuff, because you do learn a lot. But what I would say is that we have a lot of connections. I think that a supply chain, I was like an advisor for their subscription box at one point in time. Hi, Liddy. What's up? <laughs> um, and so, you know, along with their relationships, along with like li quite literally as a friend, helping them build software, you learn a lot. And, you know, we, I, I don't want to like toss shade at Amazon, but it almost feels like if I could say it the most appropriate way possible, like it's like a buying Google AdWords, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like you just, you just probably should do it. And there is definitely a percentage of people where if they do the marketing, if they do all the elements correctly, they can make a killing on Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. But 
I think it's really important to decide, like, are you going to push people to your website? Are you going to push them to retail? Like, really dominate a channel. And maybe it is Amazon. But, you know, I, I know that if I had a product and I was doing Amazon, sure, I might use Bulu for fulfillment. But I'll tell you what, I would definitely have a professional mm -hmm. that understood the marketing right. aspect of it and was managing that part of it. And also, one other thing that I should add is, you know, we do take on a lot of excess work for some Amazon companies. So, you know, they might be one thing. And, and this is actually kind of across the board. And I would say that there are a lot of companies out there that if I said the name, people would know who they are. But in reality, we're doing a bit of stealth fulfillment for them, right? They can't do the kidding or they can't do certain things. So that comes to us. And, um, you know, even there was a, a point in time where we attempted to do Amazon returns, which um, a huge opportunity, just not in our wheelhouse, you know, but I'm, I'm a fan of Amazon. I think it's required, but I also think that um, it's part of a bigger strategy unless you are one of the lucky few that really crack the code on Amazon. And to crack that code, I just think it kind of takes everything out of a team to really dominate and continue to manage that moving forward. Yeah. I'd also argue to get a lot of reach in Amazon, you unfortunately have to pay to play a bit uh, with their ads program. And yep. there is technology, yep. as you know, that's available now too that can increase and decrease kind of like like your bid cost for placement based on brand and non-branded kind of keyword terms and stuff in Amazon search, but, you know, and trying to get into the buy box and things like that. But so interesting. What was it two years ago? I think we'd, whenever that big Amazon conference is, um, I remember the year where there were booths and everybody from Amazon was being super polite to everybody. And everybody's like, this is great, you know, whatever. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I'm putting a flag in this kind of, <laughs> you know, this thing because, you know, like a Google isn't really great to customers because they, you, you have to use the product, right? And so when I kind of saw that tide shift a little bit, I've kept my eye on Amazon where I go like, okay, they're being really nice to everybody mm -hmm. at these conferences yeah. and they're offering more stuff. But it's actually been really beneficial for us because the thing that, you know, and, and I have it on pretty good authority is from some members associated with our team is that they're just always going to continue to streamline and do things um, efficiently and low cost. And that leaves a big opportunity for any level of customization. Right. And I kind of laid out my business plan to my my folks kind of on the inside at Amazon. And I was I was kind of freaked out because a lot of what they were doing was what we were talking about. And um, the person that I know looked up at me and, and they go, pa Paul, you're fine. And I was like, why? And they go, we will never come close to the level of customization that you can provide. Right. So like stick to that, make sure people know you could do kidding and, and Assembly you know, and I don't that, think yeah. there's a threat. And I was like, that was like a really quick, <laughs> it was right in front of me. But one of those things you're like, oh no, <laughs> Amazon just announced at the conference they're like kind of coming after what we're doing but um that was yeah that's kind of cool moment so interesting i know with the amazon i'll just my one kind of parting note on that is that so there's a, a few different options for fulfillment obviously there's the fba that's fulfilled by amazon but there's also uh fulfilled by merchant so sell on amazon yep. merchant fulfills it that could still be through bulu they also have the seller fulfilled prime so you have some kind of a really tight relationship yep. with amazon uh, listed as a prime member because you're shipping quickly or faster than the normal shipping option and then getting yep. a prime label on your product is very interesting. So are you aligned with Amazon in that regard? If someone was seller fulfilled prime, even though you yeah. have a three day ground shipping option, can people still have that label and you still feel like on their Amazon listing? Can you fulfill that? Or are you strictly more about the uh, fulfilled by merchant um, through Amazon? Yeah. The answer is yes. If you're going to ask me how, I would have to pull in like three people from our team. But yeah. also I do know that there always seems to be like kind of a inflection point where we we will look at a client. Clients are always just a, like dumbstruck when we do this. Um, and it's happened many times where, you know, we see what they're doing. And as for example, is somebody had 5,000 SKUs, really tiny items. And, you know, I was watching our team do it and, and we were making great money off of it. But when I watched it, I thought like, man, that really is closer to a direct mail house fulfillment than it is actually like a pick and pack. And so, you know, we lost a ton of money, but we had a really happy client where we formed a relationship and sent them over to somebody else. 
they were fighting not to leave. And I'm like, no, dude, trust me on this one. We did our homework. You're going to save so much money. They, they love us now. But it's kind of same with Amazon, right? Like there's just a point where we identify like, you know, you might be better going with one of our partners or here's a few names because, you know, there, there's just a certain point where if it's really, truly a big strategy for them, you do maybe want to get better service or marketing worked in. But I like being able to tell people that, you know, for Amazon or for certain aspects of our, our company, we'll, we'll do it forever and we're happy to take your money. But the moment we can find something that makes more sense, like why wouldn't we make that relationship work? Because we know the customer acquisition cost in digital marketing is brutal. So why would we hog the margin when we know a better chance, better opportunity mm -hmm. um, for you to save a little bit? And I will also say with Amazon, this was kind of a learning experience for me. There are levels of shipping that nobody knows about that they partner with people on. And one, as for example, with that, if you go to, I think it's amazon.com forward slash SWA, it's like their subscription, or you could search Amazon subscription boxes. It's a bit of a hidden site that not a lot of people know that exists, but we are one, I think we're the only vendor that's approved to basically take on and white label and do fulfillment for that very specific subscription box category, which we thought was going to be a huge moneymaker. Mm -hmm but nobody talks about it you know nobody there's no badge or anything like that so it really did nothing for us except for kind of like work with amazon but yeah there's all sorts of different levels and i would say find a good partner to start with but if it truly becomes one of your like your go-to main revenue source strategy spend time and work with your partner to continue to build that and find a great fit and you know, for, for like something like Prime, I know we would handle that, but if we saw it really catching, we'd probably use one of our other facilities or we'd probably, I know exactly the name of the company that I would bring it to and say, Hey, this is our client. You know, it's going to go smooth integrations, et cetera. Let's put together a plan, a cost and just surprise them with it. So they don't have to stress about it. Okay. So to recap, so there is your Shopify store. That's your direct to consumer. You can help that whole fulfillment. There's yep. so that's the B2B, the B2C kind of opportunity. Yep. We got Amazon as a, as, as a starting point of our multi-channel experience. I, I want to pivot a little bit over to the social side of fulfillment because I think yeah. the influencer side of it is, is a huge business. I mean, TikTok yes. shops is, is massively blowing up right now. I'm just about to interview the company uh, that released some software called Calo Data, K A L O yeah. and data.com. Such an interesting piece of software. It's in your wheelhouse because there's a lot of supplements and sports nutrition y, uh, you know, consumer packaged goods. And, and my mind is massively blown what this software is doing, showing the revenue that's being generated weekly and then by influencer amount of revenue is being generated from these uh, TikTok yeah. influencers. Someone has to fulfill all of these orders and there is a truckload yeah. of them. This is almost like this yep. almost like your prospect list, to be quite honest with you, uh, for Bulu because yeah. Yeah. It's, there's so much incredible stuff. I'm just, I just did a, I, I just did a quick kind of like filter supplements and then start putting them in order and there is ridiculous amounts of revenue daily that's happening. Some, yep. some brands are doing like a couple hundred thousand a day in revenue, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's nuts yeah. with a twenty-three dollar yeah. average order value, twenty thousand a yeah. day. Crazy. Sorry, not twenty thousand, two hundred thousand per day. It's just insane. So, yeah. my thought to you is: okay, are you prepared for that? Are you currently working with TikTok influencers and their particular direct-to-consumer brands? Because it seems to be such a growing market for Gen Zs and Alphas that are buying now. On yeah. The platform. The answer is yes and yes. And I would say we're still trying to kind of crack that code. Yeah. <laughs> um, so over the years, you know, whether it was like Ryan's world or, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. you know, we, we've just had so many influencers reach out to us. And what I would say was um, it was a very polite no thank you because, you know, there's there were just people involved like managers and agents and you're like the margin's gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are, you know, influencers I, I have a huge amount of respect for. It's they're, they're closer to artists, right. you know, yeah. and they're just it feels like it's in that stage right now where. Yeah, I could share, you know, Gary V, um, who's another one, this Ryan Trahan. It's one of those, like, I, I knew nothing about it, but we had a rushed order come in and it was like 60,000 of this candy and we nailed it on time, on plan, on budget. Mm -hmm. 
And we said, do it again. And they did again another 60. And we're like, do it again. You know, and, and they were shocked that we could keep up. Yeah. And we were shocked that, you know, they were looking at it from a different angle. So it feels like in the industry, number one, TikTok is it, it's like Google AdWords all over again. Mm -hmm. It's just like this crazy, like for me, yeah. right? Like it's like, whoa. And so it is a wave, right? And I'm cautious with waves, but I would say that we are luckily in a position now where if the right influencer or whoever comes to us, and you can see they really have a business mindset and, and you know, all, all those things align. And we, our big thing is like, we just want one point of contact. And, and honestly, if we can't have one point of contact, we're just, we've killed more deals with influencers that people would probably lose their mind um, if I shared some of their names. But we also know that that tends to be a disaster if you're just working with 15 people and none of them have a logistics background. So it feels like right now in the industry, there are a lot of people rushing to it there are a lot of people talking a really big game. And if I'm an influencer and I don't have a lot of background, I'm definitely going to believe the people that, you know, use the big words, use the big language, you know, whatever. Um, but the more that I've listened to podcasts, the more that I've read up, I'm like, whoa, these margins are kind of crazy that they're going to the wrong areas. Right. And so I think that probably there's going to be a bit of an awakening of a lot of sales, but a lot of that margin went to people that aren't typically involved in the industry. So I would say my attitude is, yes, we'll take the call. Yes, we would love to crack the code. But if there isn't somebody that's truly building a brand, if they're just kind of hawking a product, I would much, much, much rather take a small, boring catalog supplement, yeah. <laughs> you know, that has, and, and part of our requirement is like, we do want to see order history. We don't want any sensitive data, but we do have our own kind of model that we run things through. And if it is a, you know, I got a, a buddy that just dropped like 4 million in t-shirts on TikTok, and yeah, I really pushed him to do his own facility. Um, he was upset we wouldn't do it, but I was like, there's no real brand behind this. It's just like t-shirts and there's no kind of quote unquote moat around it. Now, if the brand was not just about the t-shirts and the brand was about something deeper, like, I don't know, this is for single mothers, yada, 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 like it had a specific audience and the brand stood for something. And let's even say they sell a fraction of what the other company just selling a product sells. I'm very much more interested in that brand. Because I think in five to seven years for consumer packaged goods, with the technology and manufacturing, with the speed and rate at which the supply chain is getting, like it's evolving, um, I think if you don't have something that your brand stands for and something that you know your customer can hold the product and people know, whoa, they care about the environment, whoa, mm -hmm. they care about you know whatever it is. I think that a lot of those things are just going to evaporate, right? And I think if you're not building around a brand, it's very dangerous. So we are in a luxury position where we can be picky. And if you're not building a brand, but you're shipping tens of millions, and then you are building a brand, but you're only shipping a thousand a month. We're much more interested in the it's latter. Interesting when you talk about Ryan Trahan. So uh, my my kids uh, follow him on on YouTube. I just checked fifteen million subscribers. A uh, couple a couple two or three Wild, million right? on TikTok. So I went to Joyride, which is his his. Uh, my kids are dying for it. They want. Hey, I'll get your bag, like, man. It's, it's, it's right impossible me. to get, and that's funny. You go to the you go to is the it? website right now. It says sold out. That's wild, man. Well, we're ready. Uh, we've already, I'm glad yeah. you let me know that. I'm going to probably figure out that manufacturing yeah, challenge so whatever <laughs> it is it's so interesting and then um i also think about like paul logan another uh, big influencer with prime energy drink yeah paul logan blew up and did his thing and, and i think another brand yep. that's gonna on a lot of people's radar i used to manage it uh ghost lifestyle so they're a supplement company but they've also branched out yep. now ghost is the main primary brand it's yep. branched out now it's even in canada available now i see but they're it's just, now they're in the energy drink market too fighting monster and 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 a few other biggies out there yeah it's so interesting, like just the reach that a lot of these influencers have. But I also believe that you're right. There needs to be some business acumen behind the brand. Yeah, what, what's yeah. the longevity? And I see some of the benefits of what Trahan is doing. Like he's not just literally flogging 
candy. He, he's very clear about the fact that it's vegan and low sugar and low carb and non-GMO. Yep. And he's very yep. specific saying that's, Solve a problem. that's my value prop. Yep. That's my unique value, what I offer. And it's so interesting that you're yep. a fulfillment company for them. So that's... <laughs> well, one of the cool things, and thank you for sharing that information. I'm, we're more trying to keep up, but you know, it's, it, it's definitely one of those things where it's like, why, why is a fulfillment come like, who, who's this guy yeah. in Nebraska, you know, but luckily for them specifically, um, there was a client that sampled through Bulu box 10 years ago and they had a real issue with their formula and wish getting it in a packet. And, um, they just happened to be associated with this team ryan trahan's team and it was one of those like you know i i know this guy and we got connected with him and and it was cool because they were very close to quote unquote there and i'd say they're still kind of like getting there but the right people with experience like their, their team is not talkers their team is experience and doers and like that that's the evolution that i see needs to happen and and it is cool. I got a five and a seven year old boy and they're running around going like, whoa, this is here. Like, yeah. this is here. And I'm like, oh, is this what? <laughs> is this important? <laughs> but yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but I would say, you know, I just listened to a podcast with uh, Ben, Ben Ackhot. Is it Ackhot uh, or Ackhot from um, uh, ACOTT? Okay. I think he's on the Mr. Yeah, Beast yeah, yeah. team, okay. the Feastables. Yeah. And I got, you know, all the brands you named and, and, and this thing I have connections to and like, you know, I was listening to the podcast. He's like, you know, Mr. Beast really focused in for a year and a half, two years just on business. And like, he's got it. And, and I just kind of thought to myself, like, that's a great talking point. There's probably truth in that. But like, really, you do like, it's kind of like on top of all the things you're doing, you decide to get good at business and it takes a year and a half or two because <laughs> I must be doing something very wrong. But, you know, it's just, I can't imagine in that position with 15 million followers ever for a split second believing you could be wrong or somebody else could be better at something and so that's that's i think kind of the the gist of it but there will be some winners and losers and i and i will say this i do think the future it's closer to people promoting products than it than it is company i mean even with us like our team in marketing puts me as the face because who wants to listen to a company, right? Like who wants to listen to that? Like, like be real with me. And I think that's very closely related to like what the brand stands for. Right. And I think Trahan and Joyride are doing it absolutely correctly. And I don't know, maybe we'll, uh, next time you talk to me, we'll have some candy manufacturing equipment in our, in our warehouse. And make sure I give you my address too. My kids will be like blown away. They're yeah, like, whatever. <laughs> I'll give you my credit card. Dude, I got like, for real, <laughs> okay. I got you, man. Like there's, there's, if, if there's a scratch on a bag or whatever, you know, I got to whatever. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll get it approved. Right. I swear. Good job. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, that's it's just such a cool space mm -hmm. to watch. But I, I definitely would be cautious to build a business around servicing something like that. But like I said, you know, boring supplements or boring anything that's been around for a long time. You know, those those are much more interesting to me. I, I like boring, <laughs> right? This is lovely. I've learned a ton. I always joke on the show that I, you know, the number of pages that I've written is, yeah. is kind of the justification of how engaging and learn. I just I have this life of learning kind of mantra. I just yeah. love it. I think that I just, I feel I'm in such a great position in the world that I get to interview people in their wheelhouse of kind of what they do so well. Yeah. And I learn a lot. Yeah. And just, you know, you know, you're someone new that I've met now. It's just like, hey, whenever there's like a logistical challenge on something, especially right. in supplements and CP, PG and kind of, you know, it's just like, hey, I know someone that you can talk to now. So, so Paul, I just yeah. want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I knew we're nearing the oh, hour here, but I guess my thought is, is that like, what do you believe are some of the next steps? Because I think there's going to, there's thousands listening to this episode right now. And I think what I want to do is I want to figure yeah. out everybody's on a different kind of entrepreneurial path right now, like, wh wh like where yeah. they are in their journey. And so, what do you think the next steps are for people listening and saying, hey, I'm self-fulfilling and I'm at a level where I think maybe it's time to consider moving to Bulu or uh, they just need some kind of like next steps in kind of like in their fulfillment journey. Like, look, I want to throw it back right. to you and saying, hey, like, what do you offer as a service or what do you want people to do that are listening today as kind of the next steps? 
Yeah. Well, you know, we've been, first of all, thank you for your time. I appreciate being on your show and, and thank you for anybody still listening out there. And as crazy as it sounds, I've just kind of always done this where if you've made it this far, just drop me an email, uh, maybe toss an emoji <laughs> in the subject line so I can yeah. know, <laughs> but it's just Paul at Bulu group. That's my email, Paul at Bulu group.com. Drop me an email and we really have found our place after 12 years and helping create some brands like Liquid with IV and Squatty Potty and, you know, brands that nobody's ever wanted to talk to. And, you know, we have, we have a lot of big W's, not with just big brands, but brands that people really kind of didn't give any time to. And, and I think the way that we always have done that is we love to talk shop. We love people calling us. We never try to sell people logistics, fulfillment, et cetera. Actually, just this morning, I turned away, our team turned away a big clothing brand because we said, you know, the return logistics on this is going to be difficult. Here's three people we would talk to. Let me make an intro. They were shocked because we were like the seventh company we talked to. And they said, nobody did that, right? But it's the reality is that if people contact us, it might take me a while or I might pass it on to a member of my team. But we know that if we can help answer logistics questions, remove that intimidation, we give tours here all of the time. We literally give tours to our competitors, to our software companies that we buy from, because our attitude is a rising tide raises all ships. And if we can answer the question, get you unstuck, maybe it is with us, but nine out of 10 times it's not. But if that one little person, and I've been that person, right, that you find out that information from, it can really change the game for you, right? We have a coffee packer next door. On the other side, we have a flour package good manufacturer. You got cake mixes, you got whatever. I know the power of if we can do work with those companies locally, et cetera, do whatever product it is, that saving one to four dollars is an absolute game changer for people. And if we do that ourselves or we pass them on to a partner that's a good fit, the only thing we do is say, hey, like, don't forget about us. If you know somebody shipping, send them to Bulu. Just have me email Paul and we'll figure out from there. And being that force, that kind of entity that truly is making the right connections and giving a few tips. That has been the thing that just, we have more inbounds than we can manage. And it's a lot of stuff in the wrong kind of category, but it is something that we really love to do. And frankly, I would much rather help people with a growth mindset than, you know, go sit at my desk and ink around (laughs) in Excel, right? Like I, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy doing podcasts because only a couple of people did it for me and I know what a game changer Absolutely, it can be. Yeah. I'm glad you're coming came on the show today. I really, I really do appreciate it. Paul at uh, bulugroup.com. Um, you can go to bulugroup.com is the kind of primary domain. There's lots of good uh, resources and some really great stuff. The blog and everything is there. Pauljarrett.com is your kind of primary, I guess your kind of personal brand. I love the picture on your main cover of Pauljarrett.com. Yeah. Clearly your team members just chuck those the after the picture. Up into the air. <laughs> it's either yeah. superimposed after the fact or someone just chucked a bunch of boxes up that you had in your warehouse. Uh, somebody <laughs> handed them to me. And I said, this is a lame picture where I'm holding boxes. I said, get the camera ready. I threw them up super high in the air and I stood there and I got pelted. <laughs> yeah, there was stuff in some of them. So yeah, but we're, we're used to the bumps and bruises. Yeah. This is lovely. All right. Well, thank you so much for recording today. Um, have yourself a great afternoon. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. You too. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.